Amen. Good morning. This morning we want to spend some time sharing with you about our brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling. They have asked first for prayer and if you feel led to financially support them. What is different about these brothers and sisters is that we do not see them on a Sunday morning for they are living in other countries. They have either felt God's Holy Spirit prompt them to leave their country and reach lost souls, lost souls in countries hostile to Christianity, or they have grown up in a hostile country. They have become a Christian and have a passion for their own people to come to know Christ. Several years ago, our church had Charles Alzheimer's speak at a big buck night outreach at our church. One of his quotes always stuck out to me. If you are born in the United States, you have won life's lottery. What an incredible opportunity God has given us growing up here. Others have not had this opportunity. Randy Elkhorn wrote a short book called The Treasure Principle. In it, he reminded me that we have all been given, in differing measures, gifts, talents, time, and money. God has intended for these to be used for our basic provisions and to be enjoyed. However, he has also given these to us for the purpose to further his kingdom for his glory. He has invited us to give these back to him and has promised eternal treasures. The video you're about to see is from Voice of the Martyrs. Voice of the Martyrs is an organization committed to helping spread the gospel message of Christ by equipping missionaries and local committed Christians with sharing the gospel, providing Bibles, and helping to grow churches supporting the persecuted by providing food, shelter, and medical needs. This video summarizes a Nigerian family. Just like families here in this church, they have also have dreams and aspirations, just like we do, and for our children. However, these were shattered by forces opposed to Christianity. My name is Rebecca. I live in the north of Nigeria. One evening I was out with my daughter and on our way home we saw smoke rising above our village. We were under attack. There was nothing we could do to defend ourselves. were married in that village. My wedding day, it was the happiest day of my life. Some members of our church gave us a wedding gift. It was a Bible. We read it together every day. And when our children were old enough, we read it to them and their friends. Let the little children come to me. Let the little children come to me. And do not forbid them. And do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. Such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 19. Verse 14. On the day our village burnt to the ground, my husband and my son were killed in the attack. I was devastated. I mourned for many months. Some of us 
us who are able to return to our village to reclaim anything that was left. Parts of Genesis and Revelation were burnt, but the rest was mostly intact. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a wild flower. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. I still use this Bible. It reminds me of God's faithfulness. Naked I came from my mother's womb, but naked I shall return there. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord is a husband to all widows. Now I look to him for every need. This is what I am still holding on to. On the screen, you will see a map that shows countries hostile to the gospel being spread or countries that outright restrict the spread of the gospel. These are the type of countries that the Voice of the Martyr seeks to get the gospel to and asks you to partner with them. Quite often, those being persecuted ask first and foremost for prayer and second for the Bibles. In the back foyer, we wanted to provide you some resources about our brothers and sisters in Christ worldwide. Some of the resources are a prayer bookmark located in your bulletin, a variety of monthly magazines highlighting the work in different countries. Um, these are excellent short stories here, and feel free to take two or three of them. You can also go to the Voice of the Martyrs website and get a free monthly magazine. There is also a prayer calendar in the back. Each day it will give you a specific need to lift up to God in prayer. At the Voice of the Martyrs website, there are also podcasts that give you a more in-depth look of specific ways the gospel is being spread in hostile countries and the challenges they are being faced with. We would never ask that you would give any money out of guilt. If you are not in a position to give, God understands. We also encourage you to take advantage of some of the resources, visiting the website, grabbing some information in the back, and spend some time with it and in prayer. Show it to your kids. Ask God what role he may want your family to play, play in spreading the gospel to people outside of our country. 
If able, consider giving a small portion to our persecuted brothers and sisters. Ask God in faith to use it for leading others to Christ and growing disciples. If you would, can we come together in prayer before our Father? Dear God, thank you for the freedoms of our founding fathers have given us. We have truly been blessed in this country. Give us courage and wisdom to further the gospel in our neighborhoods and in our country. We also pray right now for our brothers and sisters who have been and are being persecuted for their faith for the sake of your gospel. We ask for a blanket of protection and provision over them physically, emotionally, spiritually. We ask that you would change the hearts of the persecutors and they would receive your grace and forgiveness. But if they do not change, we ask that you would remove them from their place of power and position. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, thank you, Clark. Um, I was doing some research this week, and did you know that 360 million Christians in the world right now are facing what Open Doors has considered intense persecution? That's greater than the population of our entire country. Christians around the world are facing intense persecution, and you know uh, that's going to be the topic of our message this morning because. Um, I, mean, I mean, I wish as your new pastor, I could come and say fuzzy, nice, warm, warm, tingly things to you every Sunday, and you leave here just feeling so great about stuff. But the Bible is replete with this topic. It covers it over and over and over again, what it's like to live under a state of persecution for our faith. I would not be faithful to God's word today if we did not top it, t- tackle heavy topics as they arise and become relevant. And because of what Clark has shown, shared this morning, this is a relevant topic this morning. So we're going to look at a few key points in several biblical texts this morning that are not necessarily going to make us feel all warm and fuzzy inside, but are going to challenge us from God's word, what he has to say about this particular subject. So as we begin, I want to ask you a question. Would you, how, how, how would you respond if tomorrow morning you went into work your boss called you into his office and he said, hey, we're participating in this, this event as a corporation and uh, you need to be a part of it. But you know fully well that going and being part- participating in that event goes contrary to your Christian faith. Would you be willing to lose your job because you did not participate in something that went against your faith? Or what if uh, you posted a Bible verse on your social media account and you were notified by your employer that you need to take that down or risk losing your job, what would you do if a government agent showed up at your door and said you need to take a sensitivity course and you need to uh, go back on what you said because that's hate speech? What would you do if, God forbid, a government agent would show up at your door and say "You you need to recant your faith publicly, you need to sign this document recanting your faith, or we're going to take your home? What if the government decided that you could no longer parent your children because you're trying to raise them according to God's principles and they're opposed to that? What would you do? Here's the thing, it's a trick question. Because if you're like me, you're probably sitting there and you're answering that and you're going to go, well... I, God forbid, I hope that never happens, but I would, I would stand firm in my faith. And that's the wrong answer. Because you and, me, you and I are sitting here going, I hope that never happens. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't want it to happen. But I think I'll stand, true if it, it, I'll stand for faith if it does happen. Because here's what's really, that's an attitude I actually really want to challenge you this morning from God's word. Because that's the wrong perspective. Because here's the right perspective. Around the world, millions and millions and millions of Christians are being intensely persecuted for their faith in just such a way. And they are our heroes. They are the heroes of our faith. Not only that, this is going to be a harsh truth this morning that I want to share with you. And I feel, I've, I, I hate to burst your bubble. All right, this is going to hurt just a little bit. It's going to sting just a touch. 
Because if the history of Christianity is true, if the scriptures are true this morning, if what we know about our faith is true this morning, that experience is the fullness of our faith. And what we are experiencing is something totally different. I'm going to share an illustration with you that is <clears throat> stupid. I'm sorry. I was just thinking about this. This is the, I, don't, I don't know why this week as I was praying about this. This was the illustration that came into my mind, and I am so sorry. I will apologize in advance. I want to introduce you to somebody. This guy's name is uh, Psychorludus frictus. He's an interesting fish. Go ahead and put that up on the screen. He's an interesting fish. He, uh, he, he lives in the ocean at incredible depths of up to 4,000 feet deep near Australia and New Zealand. He uh, experiences at that depth 120 times the atmospheric pressure that we uh, are experiencing right now. God has created this little guy with no bones, few, no scales, and not much for muscle because he doesn't need it at that depth. He floats around and just eats. Uh, at that crushing pressure, it gives him stability, all the stability his body needs. He lives up to 130 years old and has no natural predators. And yet, he's at threat for extinction from deep water fishermen catching them and bringing them to the surface. Uh, this is what he looks like when he's brought to the surface. You know him as the blobfish. He's been consistently voted the ugliest animal on the planet for years. I'm sorry. It's stupid. That's dumb. I don't know. I know what you're thinking right now. You're going, is there like a 90-day return policy on new pastors? Can we send him back and get a refund? Uh, I was just thinking about that because I was like, man, what, a, what an illustration of this is, not his, this is not what he was built for. He's not built to be taken out of the pressure. When he comes out of the pressure, he turns into a fat, ugly mess. All right? And I want you to understand something. Our Christianity, how we practice our faith, is kind of the fat, ugly cousin of what most Christians throughout history have experienced. Do you have a fat, ugly cousin? Are you willing to admit that you might be the fat, ugly cousin? <laughs> I know it's a harsh statement to make, but look, the truth of the matter is our Christian walk and Christianity as a whole thrives under pressure, and that's what I intend to prove to you this morning. Um, uh, it grows under pressure. It becomes something beautiful under pressure. From the beginning of Christianity, uh, it has changed the world through persecution and pressure. And if you and I want to experience the richness of God's provision, we must find ourselves at odds with our culture. We will not be what the ungodly world has in mind when its systems are created and designed. Christianity, although it's foreign to us because we live in a Christian nation, Christianity was designed to be counter-cultural. Christianity at the top of the power structure, controlling culture, is not what it was supposed to be. Christianity lives underground. Christianity faces pressure. Christianity thrives when it's built upon sacrifice and pain. In fact, I'm going to take it one step further and say that according to Scripture, and I intend to prove this to you this morning, is that persecution is proof that our faith is truly genuine so um, I'm going to be jumping around in scriptures this morning and I know it's going to be a little hard to keep up so I apologize for that but I intend to make four four main points this morning the first one is this persecution and oppression are a blessing of Jesus it says this in Matthew 5 10 blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven this is the words of Jesus in a passage that we commonly refer to as the Beatitudes the kingdom of heaven, think about this for a second, belongs to the persecuted. Our theology states that one day you and I will reign with Christ, and if this passage is true, the people at the top of that flow chart are going to be the persecuted. The ones that will rule first will be the persecuted and those who have died for their faith. Have you considered for a second that the price of our comfortable cultural Christianity the price that we pay for that is prominence in heaven. That you and I will not reign in heaven with the same authority as those who have died for their faith. 
who have given their lives for it. The kingdom of heaven is ruled by those who have sacrificed. Uh, Tony Evans says, if we, we want to reign with Christ, but not suffer with him. You understand that the heroes of eternity will be the ones who know what true sacrifice is. They will be the ones that will show us what the fullness of faith is like. That for all of eternity, we're going to be hearing the stories of, and we're going to be learning from, and we're going to be growing by hearing about the experiences of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice here on earth. Persecution and oppression are really a blessing because it means prominence in eternity. Secondly, persecution and oppression are a reflection of Jesus. Jesus says this in John 15, 18. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus is saying, if you want to be like me, you're going to be hated like me. You and I aren't hated yet. We don't know what this verse means to us. We can't really connect with what Jesus is saying here because we haven't really experienced that. Somebody may have said a mean thing to you, but that's not the same as being hated by your culture. I want you to think about a really hard truth when it comes to being like Christ for the sake of the gospel. I want you to think about this hard truth. Because somebody was willing to accept, willingly knew that he would be persecuted and martyred and crucified for it. He chose to do that so that you and I can have salvation. You and I get to go to heaven because somebody was willing to be persecuted and die for it. And not just our Savior, but our faith is built on the stories of hundreds of, not, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Christians who are willing to die for the message of the gospel. You and I get to go to heaven because somebody was willing to be persecuted and crucified for it. You and I get to enjoy a comfortable cultural Christianity because our forefathers were persecuted for their faith. You and I are the product, received the blessing of someone else's sacrifice every single day. So let me ask you this. What would, were it an option for you if you knew that someone would spend eternity in heaven because of it? Would you be willing to give up your wealth? Would you be willing to give up your freedom, your comfort, your safety? Would you put it on the line so that someone else could go to heaven? I know, if you're like me, you're like, but, 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 but I don't like sharing my faith because it makes me feel weird and it makes me awkward. I'm talking more about me than you. I, I, you know how many times I've backed away from having a gospel conversation because I'm like, well, oh, man, I don't want to make it weird. You and I get to go to heaven because somebody made it weird to the point that they died for it. I'm like, is that worth an amen? Amen. Track with that. In fact, I want you to, I want you to hear this because this is the part of the story. You know, every, every, every sermon, I, I told you this before, I want you to, I mean, there's three things. I have three goals. One, I want to teach you something you don't know. We're about to learn something you probably didn't know. Um, secondly, I want you to remember it past lunch. You're probably going to remember fat fish past lunch. Um, <laughs> And third, uh, we want you to change your life, and there's a, there's a challenge in here for all of us. But here's maybe something you didn't know. In the, first, in the first 300 years of Christianity, it was illegal, illegal. In fact, the uh, Romans believed in something, they were, they were pantheists, or I'm sorry, they were uh, polytheists, which means they worship many gods. Okay, and generally when the Roman Empire would come and conquer a territory, the Greeks would conquer a territory, they would come in and go, hey, y'all, you're part of our Roman Empire now. What God do you serve? And they say, oh, we serve Baal or whatever. And they'd be like, okay, great. We'll put his idol up with ours. And they had this great big, they had this great big auditorium in, in Athens called the Parthenon. I'm sorry, the Pantheon, where they would put all these deities. You can go see it today, even if you wanted to, in Greece. Um, and then they would worship it. But Christians said, no, we worship God in the Son, Jesus Christ. We, we can't worship all your gods. And so the Christians were accused of atheism because they refused to accept the gods of the Roman Empire. And that was what really led to the intense persecution. And in the first 300 years of Christianity, there were 10 emperors that were 
greatly opposed to Christianity to the point where it was illegal and intense persecutions exist. I found this story that I found is super interesting because it's the words of one of those emperors himself, an emperor named Julian. And this happens about 364 AD after an emperor named Constantine had made Christianity illegal. And Julian said, no, I don't want it illegal. I don't want it legal after that and tried to roll back all the protections that the Christians had. I want you to hear in his words how he has come to view the Christians that are operating in his, in his kingdom, even though he is trying to have them murdered for it. He says this, When then do we think that this is enough? Why do we not observe that it is their, Christians, benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead, and the pretended holiness of their lives, that they have done the most to increase Christianity. I believe that we ought really and truly practice every one of these virtues. Is it not enough for you alone to practice them? But so must all the priests of Galatia, his priests, without exception. Either shame or persuade them into righteousness or else remove them from their priestly office. The emperor Julian was so frustrated that the Christians were being kind to one another, were serving one another, they were being benevolent to one another, they were taking care of each other, they were being who Christ called them to be in his kingdom, and he was so embarrassed that his own priests were not even close to that, and he was so upset that Christianity was gathering all these followers and his religion was falling away that he actually forced his own priests to act like Christians or else lose their jobs. That's the impact that the early believers had in the world. He was so frustrated at his attempts at persecution because it actually worked the other direction. As he persecuted more, Christianity thrived more and more people became believers. Persecution and oppression are a reflection of Jesus. Third, they're not only a reflection, they're a requirement of Jesus. If you follow in 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 12, it says this, But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, and love, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, What persecutions I have endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Verse 12, hear this. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I'm going to read that one more time. All who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Persecution is required for us to be godly. What does that say about us? Well, I mean, it's saying that there's a part of our growth as believers that we're stunted. We don't have that experience. The heroes of our faith, the first 12, the 12 apostles that followed Jesus, um, we don't have scriptural record of their experience, but we do have some history that suggests how their lives ended. And um, it's believed that every single one of the 12 followers of Jesus, the 12 apostles, died for their faith, with the exception of John, who was boiled in oil and exiled to an island prison. For the rest of them, this is what history tells us how they lived their life. Peter was crucified around 66 AD in Rome under the persecution of the emperor Nero. James... Uh, was either thrown off the top of the temple and stabbed to death, or King Herod had him killed by a sword in Jerusalem. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. Philip was beheaded and stoned to death. Bartholomew, his death is too gruesome for me to even describe in church. Matthew was stabbed to death in Africa. Thomas was stabbed to death in Iraq. James, the son of Alphaeus, was stoned and clubbed to death in northern Israel. Simon the Zealot, and the majority of you seems to be that Simon was sawn half in sawn in half in Persia. Philip was either crucified, stoned, or beheaded. Judas Thaddeus, he was said to have been killed by arrows in the mountains of Turkey. Matthias was stoned by cannibals in Eastern Asia. As a sidebar, and everybody asks you to prove your faith, 
if you were speaking to someone who doesn't accept our, our belief in Jesus Christ, many would say this. They would say, oh, that was just something made up to control people. And the people that, the people that, the people that really were behind Christianity were just trying to get wealthy and try to be, get a name for themselves and try to be notor- notable. Uh, one of the greatest defenses of our faith is that the earliest proponents of it, they had nothing to gain by their faith. They had everything to lose. These men did not die for a lie. They went to their death willingly, knowing, firmly believing that Jesus was the Son of God. They have an experience with their faith that we do not have. Um, I came across a quote by a German Lutheran pastor. You may have heard of him. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was opposed to the Nazis in World War II, and um, actually to the point where he was part of a conspiracy to, to, to assassinate Adolf Hitler. And he was arrested. He was sentenced to death on April 8, 1945, by uh, the SS judge Otto Thorbeck. And it was in a trial without witnesses, no records, uh, and no defense of the um, accused. He was executed by hanging on dawn of April 9th, the very next day. Uh, Bonhoeffer was stripped of his clothing and led naked into the execution yard, and he was hanged with six others. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That is the price of Christianity and our faith, were we really to know what it was. According to Apostle Paul, if you want to be Christ-like, persecution is the cost. Do you think that maybe a major part of our Christian walk is stunted because we haven't experienced oppression in any way? Is our discipleship and growth in our faith maybe somehow hindered by our convenient, comfortable lives? Finally, oppression and persecution are a benchmark of Jesus. Um, Most of you know this. I rode an ambulance for four years, five years. And um, there's one particular time where I found myself alone in the back with a patient um, and I'm just an EMT, you know, typically we have paramedics, but we didn't have a paramedic available that night. We picked up a lady who, um, goodness, I forget what her chief complaint was. Um, but I was doing a, uh, on the way into the hospital, I was doing a assessment on her. And how many of you are in the medical field? Okay, so you guys know what, you know what vitals are. You know, you want, definitely want to assess their breathing rate, their heart rate, their blood pressure, maybe take a glucose. Maybe if you're really cool, you put them on a four lead or a 12 lead and see their heart rhythm. Um, she was just in, I'm just an EMT, so I, I, I just take blood pressure. That's all I do. And, and heart rate, I took her heart rate. As we were having a conversation, I was doing her assessment. Her heart rate was on the, I actually had a finger monitor taking her pulse ox and it came up 38. And I know that doesn't mean much to most of you, but uh, for those of us in the healthcare field, someone with a heart rate of 38 is in a, in a condition called bradycardia, which means their heart rate is dangerously low. This scared little EMT CJ beyond belief. I'm like, oh my goodness, uh, I got to call somebody with medication quick. She needs a shot of something, right? So I'm kind of freaking out, but ready, ready to call medical control. And I see she's just sitting there like, like that was no big deal. And I, 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 put the, I put the phone down and went, is that normal for you? Because I mean, it's really alarming to me. And she goes, no, that's normal for me. And so that was her baseline. You know, persecuted Christianity is alarming to us. We go, that's not normal. We don't want to be a part of that. That's scary. But do you understand that for most Christians, that's baseline. That's where we start. Persecution and oppression are a benchmark of Jesus. Now, I'm going to read you uh, out of 1 Peter 4. I'm going to start reading, or I'm just going to read verse 12. But I want you to realize this. As Peter writes this, this is two years before Rome catches fire, the emperor Nero, I mean, as the story goes, the emperor Nero set the fire himself probably, and played his fiddle while Rome burned. We don't know if that's true or not, but we do know one thing was true, that he blamed Christians for starting that fire. So two years before this, it's also well known that Nero was having garden parties 
where he was lighting his garden parties by covering Christians in oil and setting them on fire. And Peter says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you. And I know we would like to think when he says fiery ordeal that that's like refining gold by fire. No, what he means is, don't be surprised when you get stuck on a post and set on fire by a pagan king. Don't be surprised when that happens. Are you catching the weight of that? Don't, don't be surprised when Nero arrests you and sets you on fire. I mean, as, as if history is true, he did capture Peter and had him crucified. And Peter, Peter demanded to be crucified upside down because he didn't think he was worthy to be executed the same way Jesus was executed. Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fire, fiery ordeal comes among you to test you, as if this is such, something unusual were happening to you. Again, we read that and we go, I mean, if you read that, if you were just doing your devotions and you read that, you would think that was a cute statement of Peter going, no, don't be surprised when you have a rough day and that's coming to test you. That's, that's, that's the Lord testing your faith. Don't be surprised as if something's unusual. Just, like, just to be surprised. Don't be surprised when something rough. It's not what he's saying. Don't be surprised when a pagan king sets you on fire to test you to see if you'll recant of your faith. Do you get it? Do you understand how an understanding of what persecuted Christianity totally changes? Even how we read scripture. So Peter says, don't be surprised when it happens. It's supposed to be like that. So, just to recap. Persecution and oppression are a blessing of Jesus because it means we get to reign in eternity with them. Secondly, it's a reflection of Jesus because we get to see people come to Christ because of our sacrifice. Third, it's a requirement of Jesus for us to, find, to really know the fullness of our faith and walk as Christians, little Christ. And then fourthly, it's a benchmark of Jesus because this is a standard of what Christianity has always been meant to be. So I'll ask you again, if your faith is not under pressure, if there's no cost for us to call ourselves Christian, how do we know it's real? You know, what, you know what something's worth? What you're willing to pay for it. That's what something's worth, is what you're willing to pay for it. How do we know if our faith is worth anything? Because it doesn't cost us a whole lot. Would you still claim Christ if your job were on the line? If your wealth were on the line? Would you still claim Christ if your freedom were on the line? Would you be willing to accept sacrifice and persecution and oppression if it meant that someone else could spend eternity with Christ? Would you be willing to do that? Now, I get it. That's not really much of a threat to us. But I do believe it leaves us with an obligation. Because while you and I enjoy a very comfortable form of Christianity, we are still required to obey the words of Jesus. And the night before Jesus is being executed himself, he's in the garden praying, sweating drops of blood, and praying that we as his people are one, as he and the Father is one which means that the requirement for you and I is that we bind our hearts, we join together, and we realize that there are people on the other side of the world that are not being persecuted for their faith, that our brothers and sisters are being persecuted for our faith, that the church over there isn't being persecuted, that our church is being persecuted. We have a requirement to bind our hearts with people who are experiencing this kind, this, this is their reality. So I want to give you some suggestions as we wrap up. First of all, hey, take those resources out there, will you? And when you read stories about people who are, who, are, who, are being, who are sacrificing for their faith, who are being persecuted for their faith, will you do your best to pray for them and bind your hearts to them? Will you do your best to, to, to just ask yourself the question, is there anything I can do to be a part of this? So take those materials, will you? Read about it. Pray about it. Pray for those folks. Secondly, if, you know, we have some opportunities with our missions committee here. These would be great opportunities to have some exposure to people around the world that are serving Christ. Take one of those, will you? Or, or uh, take, uh, take uh, sorry, 
be willing to consider being a part of that team. Megan and I would love to have a conversation with you after the service if, you're, if, if that's something you'd be interested in. And finally, take advantage of the opportunity to go on a mission trip if you have the chance. Go somewhere around the world. Um, so I want to end with a story. Uh, back in June, I led a mission trip to M Mexico. And it didn't make it to Clark's map, but according to Open Doors, Mexico is number 20 on the top places on the planet where Christians are persecuted. Turns out, Christianity is not good for human trafficking and the drug trade, and the, and the, uh, the old cartels don't love it. Uh, when I was in South Mexico in a region called Chiapas, which is uh, actually a fairly dangerous part of the country, I met this man. His name was Manuel. And if you take a look at Manuel, you'll notice something is interesting about him. He has a plastic arm. Manuel is a brother who surrendered his heart to Jesus in the mountains of Mexico. He began to preach salvation in Jesus' name, and a church began. He planted a church because he was being faithful. And I should also add this. In parts of, in parts of the mountainous areas of Mexico, there is a blended form of Catholicism with an animistic religion, which is kind of brutal, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of weird stuff. And so for him to come in and preach uh, salvation in Jesus' name, that you can be saved by just accepting Christ, put him at odds with the people in his, in his village. But he planted a church there, and while he was working on building his new church, two men attacked him with machetes, relieving him of his arm and slashing him across the face. Um, years later, as he told the story, the men returned to town, and Manuel was still there preaching Jesus. The men became very frightened and fled, and the townsfolk chased them down and apprehended them. And because of Manuel's grace and mercy to these two men, they both surrendered their heart to Jesus. And now today, those two men are leaders in that church. What an amazing story. I pray that you have the opportunity to meet a Manuel. Um, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, you, you are indeed good to us, and we do not for a moment take for granted the favor that you've shared on us. But God, today as a church, we recognize together that that favor came at the cost of many who died for their faith. We get to enjoy a peaceful form of Christianity because people were willing to accept persecution and opposition to buy it for us. So God, in that, may we be bound, may our hearts be bound to people around the world who are suffering for their faith. God, may we recognize that our form of Christianity is not what it was meant to be, but God, instead, that persecution and oppression are the norm. And Father, it remains the norm for believers around the world just to think that there are more Christians right now facing intense persecution in their faith than there are people even in our entire country. God, may our hearts be sensitive to that. May our hearts be bound to their suffering. May we pray for them. May we support them as we can. May we encourage them. And God, may we, uh, we realize that, this is, uh, that their faith is the purest expression. So God, thank you for sharing their stories with us today, and may our hearts be changed. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor CJ, for that word. Church, let's respond. Let's worship. Yeah, would you stand as we close in song today? Lifted 
it high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. God bless all of you. It was so good to worship with you today. We look forward to seeing you again very soon.